Hello and welcome everyone to our next uh, panel here, which is Digital Leadership in Action and also everybody, uh, welcome to everybody online. Uh, my name is Caroline, I'm going to be the host in your room, in this room here, and I'm going to be taking all the questions from the people online later on. And I'll hand over to Flavia and Selina, um, and I'm very looking forward to seeing your panel, because um, I've seen you around it, like we've all been at D-School for almost 15 years, <laughs> so let's um, yeah, hand over to Flavia first. Yeah. Thanks, Caro. Thank you very much. And welcome to our panel on Agile Leadership in Action. I'm Flavia Bloyel, and together with Selina Meyer, I'm in the very lucky position to ask a lot of questions today. You in the audience here and also the online crowd, you will also have the chance to ask questions, uh, but at the end of the panel. So we are starting. Um, Caro just said it, 15 years of design thinking at the HPI means 15 years of enablement of people from all around the world in human-centered innovation. We at the HPI Academy have a special focus on leaders, so we are very happy to really welcome three special leaders here, Manja Bartlock, Sebastian and Laura Engelhardt. And um, we really want to know more about how these leaders actually enable innovation and agility in their very own organizations. Mm -hmm. Why are we here? Um, leadership in action means for us to really gain insights into their challenges, their decisions, their leadership behaviors. So we will really take a closer look into their hearts and minds and learn from how they got things done and maybe also um, when they struggled to really have an honest and open conversation. And for that, we are already very grateful that you are here. So let's do this in good old design thinking manner. Let's listen to what they have to say. <laughs> so Manja, what's your story? Yes, hello everyone. Can, can you hear me? Okay. Manja is my name. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, I'm leading the Learning and Growth Hub at Roche Pharma in Germany. And together with my team, um, we are responsible um, to help our colleagues, which are around about 1,300, um, to, to learn and grow every day. Um, that can be individual competencies that they need for their everyday work life, but also uh, within the transformation that as a company we are in the middle of, um, to, to have a good way through, through the changes that are there every day. And um, we founded the hub around about one and a half years ago, and there were five teams in place before that, that we then um, merged under one roof. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to share my challenges as the leader of the hub today, and to give some insights how we did that, how we made sure that we, as we grew together as one team are aligned on the purpose um, and all the, the things that are coming up every day. So I'm very happy to be here, thank you. Thank you, Manja. Sebastian. Who are you and what did you bring us today? All right, thanks everyone for having me here. Uh, my name is Sebastian. Uh, I, am, um, I work in the automotive industry for now over a couple of 10, year, ten years, I think. Uh, now working for Bentley in UK. And um, I've got, I think, the best job in the world at the moment because I can create, design, and deliver a future factory, a factory which we call the Dream Factory, which is a factory which should be benchmark and innovative for the next decades of electric cars in the future, and they can, we can really describe and define this from scratch from a white piece of paper. So it's a fantastic opportunity to create something new and disruptive. Thank you. Laura, who are you and what's your story? So warm welcome and hello from me. Thank you for having me on the panel. Uh, Laura Engelhardt is my name. Uh, for Siemens, I work in the technology and innovation management, and our role is to, um, yeah, to bring cutting-edge technologies into innovation for all of our businesses, uh, for all of our sectors. Um, and for sure, we cannot do this alone, so we work very closely in a large ecosystem with our own businesses, with our technology experts, uh, with our customer startups, um, research institutions alike. And uh, one of the activities we do, uh, we do to enable this is a global entrepreneurship program that I founded uh, six years ago. 
Uh, what is special about this is that we really put um, the humans, the innovators, entrepreneurs at the heart um, because we do believe that if we empower our innovators to drive innovation, um, then they by themselves create ripples and overall we um, increase the innovation capacity of our corporation. All right, so you get an idea of who is here. Um, we want to talk about four leadership practices um, in special. So first of all, we really want to take a closer look and how can you create and actually continuously communicate a compelling vision. Then we want to take a closer look on how can you actually foster psychological safety as a leader. Take a closer look into how can you build a system where you can learn and experiment at the same time. And how can you actually enable your teams to be more autonomous when you really want to have um, self-organized teams. So we go through your stories and we will learn from you. And um, I'm very much looking forward um, to also learn more about your challenges there. Sebastian, you just mentioned that you have a dream job because you're building a dream factory. Um, I also know that building the dream factory is a huge revolution in Bentleys after having built petrol cars for more than 100 years. So it's a huge shift and you started from scratch. Um, what does it mean to actually create a vision, um, to bring aligned people towards your vision? How do you start such an endeavor? I mean, first of all, starting on a white piece of paper is fantastic because you've got all opportunities. But on the other hand, there's also pressure to do something different and not continue the work you have done the last years so far. So uh, first of all, obviously, we looked into the automotive industry. What is there? What are others doing? What can we potentially copy, paste, or modify? But I think that's not enough. So uh, we thought a bit outside the box and looked into other industries like the aircraft industry, IT industry. We invited a lot of tech companies from around the world to uh, have pitches at our hub in, in uh, UK to see what kind of technologies are there. And then by having this fantastic, uh, inspirational uh, insights, what's available, we created more or less a first wish list of what uh, our factory in the future should deliver. And we also had to, be, had to take some brave decision what is not possible, either timing-wise or financial-wise, or doesn't fit for the product. And um, yeah, this wish list is a bit like playing a top trump card game in the past. What does our company has to deliver? Volume, cars, uh, investment. And uh, with this, we created the first, let's say, a hate piece which is growing and growing, um, and it's getting, uh, getting more and more concrete and more details behind it. And all the loose ends, thousands of loose ends we had probably in the past are, are somehow connecting each other. So it's uh, getting a more concrete way of um, how it looks like in the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Laura, you also, we started with the topic vision right now. You also started something, you started the entrepreneurship movement. Um, but as a movement, it's also very important maybe that the people at least look into the same direction and might move into the same direction. And we talked before a lot about the topic of shared purpose. Maybe you can help us a bit. Like, what is that for you and how important is it? Mm -hmm. So the word purpose got a bit into miscredit, right? Uh, right? Like, I don't know, we, we work with that since maybe six years. Um, if you talk about purpose today, it's a bit like, okay, so what are you going to say? Um, what we really mean with that is if you have something very close to your heart, um, if you're aligned, which is aligned with your values, then you have an anchor into a vision in the future as well, and you will follow through it with a lot of resilience. So, for example, um, if I think about my own purpose, I have two kids. Um, I really want to leave this planet in a sustainable and just way, or at least a bit more than I, I found it uh, here. Um, but I know if I want to do that, I need to tackle climate crisis. And I do know we do have the technologies at hand because I work in a technological department where we, well, develop cutting edge technologies. Um, but I also do know I can't do it alone. So I need to create an ecosystem. So what I did, in this example is I have a vision, but I tie it very closely to my heart. And whenever I, I get into a barrier, I just overcome it because I'm closely tied to this vision. Um, 
And also, if I look at that vision, I mean, I'm, I, I myself am in an ecosystem, and in this way I'm in an ecosystem of Siemens. We also have a mission and vision, which is transform the everyday right now, um, which is kind of just a sentence. But if I look at it in an opportunistic way, I know, okay, this, what I want to do, it somehow ties into it so I can connect it, so I can connect through a purpose. So now if you look at the business part about it, not the personal one, um, several years ago we did a really large study on how do we drive innovation topics and which innovation topics are really successful in implementing and what are the most important success factors. And we found a lot of what you probably know, like what is the business model, how customer-centric are you, and so on and so forth. But the single most important one was the team and the innovator. And we found out that if the team and the innovator is with a topic that is really close to their heart and they believe in it and they can tie it into the overall vision, then they grow resilient by themselves. So whenever the organizational immune system kicks in and whenever you get barriers in your way, you run over it. And that's why we put the purpose part in the entrepreneurial program at the very heart. So we start with purpose. We start with what is really important to you to leave on this planet. And based on that, we create solutions. Great, thank you. So Laura just talked also a bit about the personal purpose, but you also already mentioned the one from the organization, so from Siemens. Manja, I know you mentioned in your introduction that you also had to pull in five teams that might have had different purposes or visions for themselves. So you created also a vision for the hub for yourself, but also had to pull back this like larger organizational strategy into it. Maybe you can give us some insights. How did you do that? I'm happy to do so. Um, it's right, there were five different teams and they are all experts on learning, training, coaching. Um, and since as the company we are in, in this transformation and one big piece is to how do we want to change our culture? Um, how do we implement new ways of working? Um, so the question really was how can, we, how can we support the organization by building that culture? And what is um, in the end what is really our contribution to that? Because obviously we are doing this together with the organization. Then those five different teams and all those individuals with their expertise, their experience, yes, they had their own ideas and, and, and um, yeah, they, they really wanted to shape it, but it was difficult to bring it to one common purpose. So we started um, to, and they did not know each other well, so we needed to start by getting to know each other first um, and kind of building a base on where we share ideas and, and, and create, co-create co um, this, this purpose and vision. And then we, we really started to throw ideas onto the table and discuss what could be the right thing for us. And then we always shared back into the organization. So it was clear that we are not building a purpose just for our own, but it had to fit for the organization as well. And this feedback coming back in and then looking at it again and again and again until we got the feedback now you really have a purpose that is suitable for what we want to achieve as an organization in our transformation but where the whole team with all those individuals was saying yes and this is what i can stand for that was a really interesting process it needed time it needed patience um because i had to step back as well and and have my own ideas um, you know being feedbacked and, and being proved if this is the right direction to go and in the end we managed to have a purpose together as a team uh, where we all are in and committed to to live that every day in all the actions and activities we are taking every day Manja, what you just mentioned actually plays very much into this field of psychological safety and I think you all know what it means um, having a culture where people are not punished or ashamed for speaking up. Um, Laura, your um, entrepreneurship movement soon got wings and it went international, meaning that you had the chance to really bring people cross-departmental, internationally, also from different sections together. But it also means that strangers are supposed to work together. How do you create a space of psychological safety in your entrepreneurship movement? So the second batch we did, so the first batch was just 
like a pilot version. We tested out all our principles and then we decided, yes, it works, we take another step. And for the second batch, um, we just communi communicated all over the, the organization that there is an offering and people can apply. And um, we thought it's gonna be local in Germany, but it went a bit viral. So we got from 35, over 35 countries, we got um, people and they applied from all hierarchical levels. So from the working student to a business unit CEO. And um, I mean, out of an innovation perspective, that's great, right? We, not, we want diverse teams and we want people from different expertise and so on. But um, we had them fly in for three different, um, three different program outlines. So they flew in three times for a very short, short period of time and we knew that's gonna be quite a huge financial part for them. So we need to get them together very fast so they can work actually. So what we did is, for example, we, we, we tried to put psychological safety at the very heart in each and every communication that we did. We got, read, uh, we got rid of ranks and titles right from the beginning, so everybody just talked with the first name, um, which is now pretty common, but back then it wasn't. Um, we tried um, to give little plays games, for example. So we designed a little box and put a name on it, and then uh, everybody got a box, but the wrong one, so they had to make a gift to somebody else, and so they, they shared uh, something. Um, and then we tried to, to lead by ourselves, so we show, showed ourselves vulnerable. If something didn't work, we just said, well, th this didn't work, how can we make it better? And um, yeah, so those, those are some little examples. Thank you. One other important task of a leader, of course, is also to make sense of different type of information and opinions. And sometimes what's difficult is if people don't speak up. So you basically have to rely also on your team to give you opinions. Um, Mania, how do you do that? How do you create this type of culture to foster people to speak up? Mm -hmm. As I said, we are in a transformation and the task of my team is to, to enable others to get through change in a, in a good way. And within my team, I, I had to realize that the team itself was going through change because they were part of different teams beforehand and then now they had to work together uh, under one roof in one team. And um, it, it, when we were working on the purpose and, and also other topics like how do we want to meet, how do we want to inform ourselves, how do we create transparency in the team and all that, how do we communicate with the organization, what's our offer, all that was co-created together and the team was behind it. But then at a certain play, uh, time, I realized there's some human stuff kicking in here. And that was an underlying feeling. I, 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 I kind of realized something is going on, something is holding back individuals in the team, but I had no real sense of what it was. So feedback routines in the team are helpful, but they don't solve everything. So you can have huddles every day, you can have retrospectives where people are having the experience, they can talk about things that are not going well and, and with each and every retrospective they get a positive experience, hopefully, that it doesn't hurt to speak up. But those really personal human things that are super individual, that's something you can sense and it's important to sense it. But to make sense of it, that's, that's another story. So um, what I did was I, I really tried to listen more and, and ask questions to really put the thing on the table that I'm sensing something and to clar try to clarify. And um, with this, it was super important to, to give the team members the feeling that this is a true interest in, in this person, that I, I'm really there as a leader to support that process that we were going through as a team ourselves. And that has to do something with trust. It's trust building, and I believe you can only do it by listening and asking questions and show a true interest into people. And yeah, try to create a positive experience with this. If, if, if a team member realizes, okay, I can talk openly and nothing happens, I'm not losing my job or, or I'm not getting the super cool task next week, then this is helpful for this. I think we learned a lot already, right? Let's learn a bit more. Um, Sebastian, it's in your circle of influence as a leader to create a system where you can learn and experiment. Um, and we know that in your big project, 
you're using a lot of different kinds of prototypes. So my question would be, why do you prototype so much? And what kinds of prototypes are you actually using? Well, I think prototypes are, are super important also for my learning from the past. Um, I mean, five, ten years ago, everybody was sitting in the ivory tower and were doing some theoretical approaches, uh, which weren't discussed with anybody in operations or whatsoever. And then they took decisions and then they realized or were surprised why it's not working. So I think uh, introducing uh, prototyping is a key factor also in bi big disruptional approaches and also to be fast. Uh, because it, it's gained so much speed and the learning curve is uh, so, so much faster than, than, than normal. Um, so, I mean, we do everything from, uh, we started with a piece of paper, then we went to cardboard prototyping to set up the first models. Um, for example, if you do changes in tuck times and operations, uh, not only to do this exercise in a theoretical approach, but really show on the shop floor with the people who have to do it, uh, with cardboard uh, pieces, how their environment will change and if it works or not. And with now the, uh, the, the future factory, it's a bit too big and too heavy to use cardboards, uh, otherwise we would have a long uh, construction phase. Um, we're going into a digital uh, simulation uh, because of all the different um, simulations we have to bring together from material flows to production to uh, operations to uh, deliveries and whatsoever. So we turn everything into what we call a digital twin, um, which we use to at least validate our ideas and double check if everything works. But we are not only using it for a validation of a project, we keep this digital twin alive and use this over lifetime of the factory more or less because uh, what the great purpose next to trying and simulation is that you have more or less a live test center which you can use for future changes. In the past, we always went more or less into the factory to change something, which is a bit of an operation on an open heart. And now you can try it and do something in a digital twin, see if it works out or not, and then uh, apply to it. So I think it's, it's a kind of effort to put everything at the beginning to set it up but the effort you're putting in pays off immediately and uh, you have it for, for a lifetime. Plus, I think the, by having a prototype and simulation thing, you can engage much more people because it's not something which is a, I don't know, a layout for an architect. It's really something they can touch and feel and see how it works and how everything comes together. And uh, it was a massive push in motivation and we feeling also for the people. So for us as design thinkers, prototyping is a fun part, um, but oftentimes you have to face reality when you see the prototypes are failing. How do you deal with failure? Um, I, I think that that's the main part of prototyping, to be honest, because I think nobody can scribble something down and be convinced that that's the final solution. Otherwise, uh, you probably would not meet me, you, or whatever. Uh, so with prototyping, I think you can easily find out or faster find out that something is not working. And I think this is also a task for, for a leader, even though you are convinced of it, and then you realize it's not going to work out, that you have to take bold decisions to stop it. But I think by exactly prototyping uh, different kind of options, this is how you can uh, react faster, and failing is part of innovation from my perspective, and it wouldn't be disruptive if you would not allow a culture of, of failing. So fail, but fail fast, probably. Thank you. Sebastian just mentioned also a lot of topics like digital twins and described how parallel prototyping was happening, but also described some kind of speed. And with the speed, one uh, core component for us basically in agile leadership is that we want to enable the teams to make decisions to be able to kind of act out the speed. But as a leader, in order to be able to do that, one uh, key thing you have to do is you have to share control. So we heard earlier about trust already, but it's also about like sharing your control as a leader and therefore enable autonomy in your teams. Manja, earlier you mentioned the fact that you had five teams you had to bring together. So you somehow wanted to give them autonomy, I assume. 
but you also didn't want them to then just revert back to the original five team structure automatically because that was their maybe natural feeling comfortable. So what did you do to, on the one hand, enable autonomy, but on the other hand, although maybe guide them into a strategic direction that you defined also with the vision you described earlier? Mm. So <coughs> those five teams, they all brought different um, perspectives on, on things. And it was clear that we could only reach our own purpose and support the, tra the transformation and, and the organization if we are sending the same messages and, and if we are aligned. So, and, and that's a thin line between how much can I decide on my own when I'm there working with a team or giving a training or something, and then how much do I have to share back and align with others. Um, we all had the approach to be a self-organized team and, and therefore, whenever questions came up, it was different. Some people were like, oh, no, I want to decide myself. And others, they really wanted to double check with the team. And we took this as a, as a, as a case to really discuss how, how, do, we, how we, do we do this as a team so that it's going forward. And I did not tell them how to do it. So I, I asked them, what's your idea? And then we discussed in the team. And we ended up with for example, with decision principles that we aligned. So there's not that single one-fits-all solution on how to decide because you're taking decisions every day and it's many, many decisions. But if you have some principles where you have the security that the team is behind that, this is helpful. And those decision principles could be something like, is that affecting the others in my team? Or is it something I can decide on my own? Is there budget involved? Do I need to double check if, if something there is, is there, is, could the decision I'm taking, could that damage the image of the learning and growth hub? Something like this. So those principles are helpful and again we co-created this list of decision principles together and this gives somehow security but it's not making me as a leader telling them what to do. So they, they still are autonomous in, in how they are dealing with issues that are coming up every day but they have kind of a framework and the, the cornerstones are set but how do i fill that frame that's up to them and that's the freedom they need and they want otherwise they probably would not be that motivated Sarah, your entrepreneurship movement um, is successful when the attendees of your program go out into the siemens world um, as multiplicators or as you like to say as change makers um, and bring across the mindset and all the methods they gathered there. Um, how do you enable them to actually go out there and spread the word and also infect others with, with this movement? Mm -hmm. So I'd say pretty simple. They have to go through the experience by themselves. And if the learning experience is deep enough, then they will do it anyways. Um, but also for us, it's and how we do it is that they really work on innovation projects that want, we want to pursue further. But um, at the same time, we provide them leadership trainings and um, uh, and startup methodologies, design thinking uh, tools as well, um, so that they themselves grow as well. And so at the same time, it's just very practical for us because, uh, I mean, our company is 300,000 um, employees and we cannot just train each and every one of them. Um, and also we are operating in very different markets and sectors. So it's just to build a train is very different from uh, setting up process automation. And to operate in Mexico is really different from operating in the market in Germany. So what we did right from the beginning is instead of setting up an own department, we try to enable our businesses and there we identify people who want to change something. Um, so they are the host of the current cohort. We train them, we um, enable them to run their own uh, entrepreneurship program. Sometimes we, we change it a little bit in the overall setup. We change it in what is the strategic framing. Um, and then our own goal is that they run it over times so again and again. And um, that's happening in three businesses right now. And also um, that the people there just experience something else that they experience in their daily life. And then what happens is they come back to their departments and realize, well, actually it's in our strategic core of our business, but I'm doing things differently here. So how can I change something? And that's the mechanism behind it. Thank you. 
Great, thank you all. So with a small look at the time, we have, I think, one or two more fun questions to for you before we open it up also to the audience. I think one thing we heard from all of you in the beginning was that one thing you have in common is this time of Greenfield. So you had the chance to do something new. And the Sebastian already said nicely that can be awesome to have this white sheet of paper, but it can also be a little bit maybe dangerous for sleepless nights. So let's start with the fun part. What was it in your project that really put big smiles on your faces? Okay. All right. So the last cohort, I didn't. Um, I wasn't there in the operation parts so of running the cohorts. But coming to those and just seeing the people in the spirit, how they drive innovation, how they are, and then they come back and say, wow, you started this, and um, that's so awesome. It's a life-changing experience. Now we know how to do it different. Um, yeah, that, is, that really puts a smile on my heart. Very nice. Thank you. Um, probably at the beginning, when you started this journey, um, I had the task to be disruptive in what's there. We talked about it, but obviously there's a barrier uh, for people uh, normally doing their standard job for the last years. Last years, and now you say, okay, be innovative and t try to new tools and whatever. Uh, so it was a lot of uh, learning effort and journeys we put in, and uh, to convince the people that that's the right way to go and there's these all kind of new toolkits and whatever are really helpful, um, which was a journey. Um, and when you now see the people, because we used them as guinea pigs more or less in the beginning, now we convinced them and they're now running around a bit like ambassadors of design thinking and the change. And when you then listen to people uh, who are explaining it to the next generation, it's uh, giving us a smile on our faces that we at least have some, done something uh, right and that they are now the ambassadors of something new. So, proud parent moment. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, mine is probably a bit similar. Um, what really puts a smile on my face is seeing that now, one and a half years later, uh, when, when I listen to the team, how they really appreciate the diversity in the team and how they appreciate to learn from the experiences of the others that they didn't really trust in the beginning, but now they really ask for it. That's something I'm, I'm, that makes me very happy. Um, and also the fact that by going through that change as a team, ourselves, we are now able to role model it to the organization that really needs that support in all the changes and, and the transformation initiatives that are running. So we are now able to really show how things are going and we can prove it by our own, our own experience. And that's something that's really, really cool to see. So now you heard the positive things. Now you know why you might concern yourself a little bit more with the whole topic of agile leadership. But of course, we are also very curious about the other side. So maybe to have some learnings, what did create sleepless nights for you and how did you then sleep again? <laughs> Okay, I can start. So whenever you try something new, there is an old organization still in place. Um, and of course, somehow the immune system of the old organization pops up somewhere. And you, sometimes you don't, you don't even know at which point. So you know it in theory, like, okay, this process driven or whatever. And, um, and sometimes it's just the, the overall market that, um, that affects it. So, uh, for example, if over one and a half years, we just didn't run any cohort in this program. It's um, 2019, I think, because uh, the, the overall market situation was not in a place where you could go and jump into and say, yay, now let's do something else and different, because if everybody else is in crisis mode, it's really difficult to, to put it up. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's a point of just ticking into where the immune system pops up and then finding somewhere around uh, to go anyways. And then purpose comes into place because this is the part of the, where you need to be resilient. Thank you. Wow, I don't have the specific moment. It's just like the huge you size of, sleep, of don't sleep. Don't sleep. <laughs> no, it's just the size of the project. I mean, I haven't done 20 of different factories beforehand. Uh, um, it's also my first time doing it, plus having no boundaries. And it's not that I have the expertise in everything. Uh, you sometimes do some or take some bold decisions, probably also some 80-20 decisions, and give a direction. 
and sometimes you hopefully you also hope that this is the right thing to do. Uh, at the end, it pays off. I mean, we're connecting a lot of loose ends, so um, got more hours to sleep now. But it's just like the pure size of the responsibility you have, and that you, I mean, realize you don't know everything, but still have to make the right direction and give the speed uh, for for the teams to follow. What helps you to manage this responsibility? I think to be honest, I mean, it's not that I'm doing it on my own alone. Yeah, I've, we've, I've installed, for example, a sounding board with experts, experts from around the industry where I can do a bit of sparring of, in, uh, of, of ideas. Then uh, bringing all the stuff together in a digital trim where you can really see that it's kind of working out. Then um, we've created, which was quite powerful to be honest, also to convince others from my plan, which I had in my mind, is to uh, create it. Uh, the first draft of how the future factory could look like, uh, because this is it's not the plan for an architect, it's a bit like a concept car, but it gives the people more or less the north star direction and something tangible to, to um, yeah, get from. So then I also know how far they have to jump and they align somehow on this, on this journey. And um, this was super helpful. And then we created what we call personal user stories so what is your contribution as manager X, Y, Z, and how do you be part of that transformation? And by engaging more and more people and bringing more and more people behind that vision and that uh, journey you want to go for, obviously gives a, uh, gives a bigger foundation of, of knowledge and uh, therefore also um, more success and uh, less sleepless nights. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Mania. Yeah, I, I think there were many situations where at least I had a hard time falling asleep. But um, to sum it up, I think it's this to allow yourself to let go that sometimes it's just not under your control. And even as a leader, yes, people look at you, they, they ask you for the decision, they ask you to tell them what to do, but sometimes you simply just don't know. And then allowing yourself to to show that you have own your own vulnerable what's the word vulnerability um difficult word or or that you just simply don't know the solution and to trust that somehow things will find their way through it's not easy but yeah i figured at certain points that's the only thing you can do just let go and step back and trust that somehow there will be a way um and and with this also to allow yourself to stop going into things if if you realize that everything is discussed everything is decided on everything is the people said they are committed and then when you realize but there is this individual thing the, the the system and stuff that kicks in you just cannot do anything about it and then stop trying to solve it that's another thing to to not go there into the solving mode forever you so there's something, sometimes things you simply cannot solve. And it's not under your control. And to accept that and just trust that things will be okay. <laughs> That's something I try in those situations. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So thanks for, for your honest answers so far. One thing we have under control is time today. So I gave you a promise at the beginning that you also can ask a lot of questions. Um, so far we talked about how you can create and communicate a compelling vision. We looked a bit further into psychological safety. We talked about how you can enable a system to learn an experiment. And finally, we talked a bit more about enabling autonomy in self-organized teams. So four different topics, and I'm pretty sure that you have questions. And Caro, I look at you. I think online crowd also should have questions. Um, so where do we start? Who wants to know more? Not much more than a spreadsheet with a few assumptions. 
I see someone jumping on that question. <laughs> no, feel free to answer first. I mean, uh, as you know, Bentley belongs to Volkswagen. It's probably not the most innovative uh, co uh, group or company uh, when it comes to organizational uh, structures and the massive company, so it's good that they have those kind of things in place. Um, I think you have to, if you really want to be innovative, it's not, pa it's not five minutes between 12 and lunch in your daytime job. So you have to free up the people to do that kind of job and also give them the time to do it. For example, we created a new space, like a design tank or a think tank or hub, or whatever we call it, uh, which is outside the offices. So it's really uh, a bit like the environment over here, a lot of materials where you can try out um, all kind of technologies you have in here where people really can do and try something and bring them together and also use that room uh, to um, show it to all kind of hierarchy levels. So also to the board, for example. I'm not preparing a high glossy sales pitch paper uh, to show them the progress. We bring them back into the, let's say, creative room where you really show them what we are doing and also what the unsolved uh, solutions are because I think trust and uh, is, is kind of, kind of uh, important. And uh, I think one, important bit for innovation, especially in, in uh, corporate uh, functions, is a good relation with the finance guys, because um, <laughs> no, seriously, I think this is in many companies one of the biggest blockers, and uh, having our eye as the KPI is potentially something from the past, and you should also trust and use the money you have in the bank account to do something innovative, because I mean, if you don't do it, you will not be there in a couple of years. So really get this kind of, not saying play money, I mean, you've got a purpose for it, how you spend it. But um, yeah, I think these are uh, important bits. Create an atmosphere, um, bring everybody in it from tariff guys to board members, and really have this freedom also to try something out. And be friends with the finance guys. Always. <laughs> <laughs> Carol, do we have a... May I just add yeah. a quick thing to that, because I really like the question. I think it really starts with looking at who are your stakeholders. And I realize that this is sometimes missing. You have your new ideas, and then you, you jump into it, you are in the mode, you know, trading and so on. But to really keep an eye on who are the stakeholders, where are they at, and what what is needed to take them on board, that's really the first step. And it sounds simple, but it's so important. And uh, another really important stakeholder in corporate life is Works Council. So that's uh, yeah, something really to keep in mind and to find, to co-create with, with those functions together to have uh, a more positive energy in the end. That's really key. Okay, so the, I, I want to add on that one. So the question you're asking is about how do you, how do you go your way between the exploration and the exploitation? part of the business, right? So if you ask on your individual part of I as an, as an employee of the large organization, how, how do I do it? I would add on to this, like who's, who are your stakeholders? Who is your ecosystem? Which resources do you have on hand? And what is just the easiest path to go through it? So find the people who can follow your idea and who can open doors. And the answer on an organizational level, I would say is, so for example, today I talked about this specific entrepreneurship program, but that's not the only one because that's not gonna be solve everything of our company. So what we do is we have a lot of different activities trying to tackle a lot of different levers in the organization. So there is a huge innovation fund where you can apply with your innovative idea. There is, uh, like crowdfunding campaigns. There are campaigns with external partners. There are, um, um, there's a Siemens Innovation Ecosystem, we call it. It's like a platform where you tune into and can use it for your own purposes, and so on and so forth. So I would say the, the answer is try to decentralize it. Because then, if you come back to the employee part, you have just many ways where you can sneak into and then put it up. Yeah, so that's. So we have questions. We don't have yet, but speaking of um, 
of the online audience and of psychological safety um, being vulnerable. Uh, can you send me a message? Because I'm not sure if you're not sending one or if it doesn't pop up because there were messages earlier and we don't want to miss the online questions. So maybe just someone sends a message and if there's none popping up, I'll check this iPad. Okay, then we have more questions in the crowd. Yeah, that's the fear of, oh no, if, I, if, it's, if I'm at the wrong place, right? Um, so we, we start by asking them just coaching questions, like what really matters to you? We have some techniques, it's like visual, visualization techniques, um, where we try to anchor them in the future, like from now on five or 10 years, what, what do you want to have achieved? What is really important to you? What bothers you so much? that you would spend your life working on it? Um, those are the questions. And then based on that, we form the teams. So we try to, if somebody says like, well, my family is really important to me. Yes, for sure, but now make it bigger. So, and then if you envision the whole humanity on this planet, what is it then that is really important to you? And then we try to, to bring the people together in, in teams to work on that specific problem. And then we go back and try to make it smaller again so that you can actually solve it with, with the real innovation part. And so we are pretty lucky that in our company we have so many business fields that it mostly it ties into it. Um, but also if it's just something totally different, for example, a car. I mean, if you say, hey, I really want to solve some, some health issues, but now I have to design a car. So then you can apply this purpose to your car. How, how would a car need to look like so that it solves your health issues? And then what health issues? Is it back pain, stress, reducing levels? And then apply it to the interior design. So these are some, some ways. Two questions over there. Let's start with you. Just repeat the question because otherwise the online people can't hear it. So the question was like, how do you go from being one person that may seem a little bit esoteric to the others to like proving, yes, this is working and I can show you that this works? So crazy people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now it works. Uh, okay, start. I know what you're talking about because I had times where I felt like a bit paranoid in terms of okay, I have a vision of some, something else, but I'm working in, the, in a system that is different. Um, I think for once, time has helped because all those ideas, they are not so esoteric anymore. And um, you would be surprised at how many levels in the organization, it's just, it's there, it's, yeah. It's, it's easy to do an emotional check-in in the beginning of a meeting. It's not that, not that difficult anymore as it was like years before. But if you are at that point, um, I would say go back to who are your allies? Like who are your allies who understand what you're talking about and can, um, can then in their system be the translator? So for example, I didn't found this entrepreneurship program by myself, but I had a co-founder. And we were very, we had the same thing in mind, but he talked differently about it and I talk differently about it. And that's how we try to embrace all our stakeholders. Yeah. But to be honest, I would also add um, track record. 
because I mean we're not doing it because we want to have a warm and family culture and everybody loves each other. It's also like to deliver something, to be honest. And all those kinds of tools we are using uh, is proven that you are faster, that you need less investment, that you can uh, avoid uh, mistakes in the future. And I think this is not, it's potentially a new uh, method or toolkit you are using, but people realize how good an impact and powerful it is and how many people you can engage with it. I mean, this guy, I talked about the topic about cardboard uh, pieces in an operations line to show the difference in the environment. Um, beforehand, it was only a decision from somewhere in the central department. Now people when we can really recreate or be part of the whole change. So we've got this we and feeling engagement feeling, plus really hard KPIs are definitely better with those tools than they have been before jump into advertisement from four to six we're talking about impact measurement and maybe <laughs> show some KPIs <laughs> sorry you had a question as well yes, uh, since you, uh, my, my name is Reinhold and um, since you uh, talked a lot about the alignment as an important factor for team success I'm really interested in some of your working hacks because I'm, I'm really um, you know from marketing experience uh, teams can get lost especially uh, on the fourth factor if you want to create uh, autonomous teams uh, and uh, engage them into more self-responsibilities um, people are different but uh, maybe you have some sensing or responsive techniques that might be helpful for the audience and me. okay from the online again the summary is, the summary is just how do you how do you, are there any hacks um, to align teams especially in autonomous working situations we all want to know <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if it's really a, a hack, but it, it just put the thing on the table. And that's something that's difficult for people to, to put it on the table and say, I feel there's something in the room. What is it? Why, why do we struggle? I, I feel we are not moving forward. Um, to really ask those questions and to open the floor to discuss what's there and what's needed, and then bring it into a solution mode again. Um, that would probably be my hint, um, or that's what I do. Um, it, it's a bit more tricky to, to get the team to that point because I'm not always there. So uh, how, how, can I, how can they, with this experience that is this working, do it themselves in their meetings that they are having? Um, but to, to create a culture where you, in my team, for example, we defined it the pink elephant. And now, whenever someone is asking for the pink elephant, people laugh about it, but they know exactly, ah, someone feels there's something in the room, what is the pink elephant? And then we just start talking about it. It's communication. It's, again, it sounds simple, but it's difficult to do it. Um, I think one important bit to create a team feeling is also to take this hierarchy level feeling out. I mean, there should always be someone who takes decision uh, because we have to do something for a purpose. But uh, for example, um, I've uh, demolished all manager offices at uh, Bentley because why should you, if you are there, then please speak to your guys and don't sit in the classroom with a closed door and say, I'm always open for my team, but there's a physical boundary between both. So. Um, doing this so people are sitting with everybody together and you've got communication corners where you can speak and you can speak to everybody but don't have this physical boundaries between levels. Then um, you were always talking about this balcony and dance floor uh, vision challenge. So yes, you have to be the leader or whatever giving directions and having a vision but also involve the people and speak to them and sometimes be part of problem solving or whatever and not only do the uh, leadership bit. And there's one which was really helpful for me, it's uh, the, in the Japanese methodology of how to lead, especially automotive, it's called Go Gamber. So really spend your time on the shop floor and not in the offices and uh, every change or every launch or every don't have to boil it down to automotive. Everything you want to do and you want to take people with you, speak with them, engage them, make them part of their journey, and don't decide everything in your own office, curtains down, door closed, and then realize uh, nobody's following you. I just grab your answer and um, invite you all to talk to each other, because I'm sure there are much more questions. 
Um, how can I sum this up, this session? Um, I would say uh, one question first from the from the online audience because it took a while. One? Yeah, we have to because okay. it took a while yeah, to load. Ask, um, yeah, it's a question for Sebastian. It's asking so when you're building a vision, there's so many things you get inspired about, and how do you pick? Like, how do you choose which is the right that you want to go for? Only my own vision. <laughs> um, no, I mean, for, uh, I think especially now, especially if you open up uh, the horizon to every other industry and what is going on there, I think you get so many uh, new ideas on the table and I think nobody can create a vision to say this is where we go now and that's set for, for a lifetime. So I think it's putting different kind of visions together and what you also said, giving everybody the chance to speak up and bring their ideas forward, uh, not, uh, high, uh, not based on hierarchy or on, on, on um, responsibilities. And uh, I think you also have to be brave enough as a leader with your vision to change it because you don't know everything and uh, probably there are better ideas out there and then you have to change or adjust your journey. And um, I think it's then a common approach. Obviously, it should go in the right direction. That's your job. But I think you should be open for uh, adjustments and modifications. And um, by creating this vision, which is then, I don't know, uh, founded by a lot of people, not on your own, it's a much more impactful movement than um, just uh, Sebastian's picture of the future. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So, how to sum this up? Um, for us, listening to you, um, I think it really takes guts to, to speak about all the topics you talked about today, to give us a glimpse of how you think, what's in your heart, what brought you sleepless nights. For all of you, I would say, be courageous as well. Talk about your own stories, the highlights, and also the challenges. And just be human, and by that, be human-centered, because this is what, desi what design thinking is all about. Um, Big hands of applause to the whole organization team and also to our three speakers.